Greetings. May God's peace and mercy be upon you. May the blessing of this day not be lost on any of us, but that we would rejoice in everything that is around us of this life itself and praise God for this wonderful time that we have together. Today I want to look at the book of James. This is a letter that James wrote and we're going to be looking at chapter 1 verses 19 through 27. So if you'd like to turn in your Bible with me, again, that was James chapter 1, beginning with verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and, does, and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself, and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for the blessing of this day, and we thank you for the blessing of your word and our opportunity to be here today to look further into it, that we may grow closer to you in our relationship through understanding you through your word, and also grow closer to your son Jesus in our relationship with him. And Lord, that all those who do not currently have a relationship with you through your son Jesus would come to know that you are a loving and wonderful God and Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now this letter that James wrote is actually thought to be the earliest writing of the New Testament. Uh, they're putting it sometime between 40 and 50 AD, so roughly 10 to 20 years of Jesus' life, of his ascension. And while there are a number of men that are called James that are involved in and around Jesus' ministry, it is very likely that this was written by Jesus' brother James. And so that makes this book very significant and very powerful because it was written very close uh, after, very soon after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and the ascension. But it was also written by someone who knew him intimately, that grew up with him. And it's, it's interesting because this is the very same brother who struggled to see Jesus as the Messiah. And I say he struggled because if you look at Mark, thir uh, Mark 3, verses 31 through 35, it tells us that, that Jesus' family had a lot of doubts early on. They didn't, uh, they didn't see it. They, they weren't getting it right away. And it would have been, it would have been difficult for them as, as the brothers and sisters of Jesus. It would have been difficult for them, I imagine, to see this man that they grew up with, that they called their big brother, as their savior. It's understandable that they would have difficulties with that, and that's assuming that their parents had been very open about the prophecies and about all the miraculous circumstances that surrounded his conception and his birth, and so that they would understand his true lineage. Um, we, we assume that Mary and Joseph had shared with the, their other children all of this information. But even if they knew all that, don't you think that would have been a little bit difficult? Because this is, this is a person you grew up with. You got to separate it at that point, and that could be difficult. But despite all those previous issues, he's now speaking boldly of the salvation that comes through Jesus. And in this letter, he takes a absolute no-nonsense look at the hypocrisy of man. Uh, he doesn't hold back on any of it. He calls it all like he sees it, and he hits to the core very hard, but he still manages to do so in love. And when I say that, the reason I say that is because James uses a, a Greek word or phrase that often translates as brethren or brothers and sisters. Now, this was a very endearing term. This wasn't just, you know, to who it may concern. This is someone, people that he cared for and he, he loved. And he used this phrase, this term, more than a dozen times within this relatively short letter. 
He's reiterating the love and the care that he has for his readers. And he's very deliberate to be clear so that there are no further confusions for these, for these issues. So in verse 19, it says, take note of this, because he's stressing the seriousness of what is to follow. He wants everyone to understand, the, and, and because he cares about them, he wants them to see these points that are important. And so he points them out to them. He, he illustrates and illuminates and says, this is what you need to be focusing on. This is what you need to look at. And so as soon as he says, take note of this, he says, everyone should be quick to listen. Sounds simple, right? But I think for most of it, most of us, this is actually extremely difficult to do. See, when, when we're truly listening, we're focusing on what's being said. We're listening to the words that are being used, the formality, uh, the tone. We're, we're paying attention to all the nonverbal clues that are being conveyed. But And good listeners are then affirming what was said and then forming a response. But more often than not, I think that, and I know I'm just as guilty of this as, as anybody, uh, I have a tendency to, while I'm listening to people, I'm processing and I'm also forming my own response while they're still talking. And I'm sometimes patiently waiting to respond, but I've already got my response formulated. Uh, it's, no, it's no secret that the mind will read and think and, and communicate far quicker than we can actually verbally. Uh, if you, if you uh, doubt that, try reading a sentence or a paragraph, better yet a paragraph, it's a better example. Read a paragraph to yourself in your head and then read that same paragraph out loud. And if you're timing yourself, you will read it much quicker in your head than you would out loud. Uh, same thing if you have something that you've memorized. You'll say it much quicker in your head than when you say it out loud. It's just the way that our brains work and process. But a good listener will wait, and they'll be focused on what they're hearing. And a sign of a, of a conversation between two good communicators, people who are taking to heart this uh slow to uh, quick to listen and slow to speak that's the next point that he talks about there will be a lot of pauses in those conversations because they're not dividing their focus while they're listening they're they're focused purely on what is being said by the other person and they're taking that in and they're considering what is being said and then once they're done talking then the listener will process, finish processing it, they'll consider, they'll reaffirm what was said, and then they will develop their response. They'll give their response. And there are, it's funny because there are experts uh, all around the world. This is, this is a huge business. People that are experts in good communication. And they get paid insane amounts of money to p tell people this exact same thing, to tell people that you should be quick to listen Focus on what is being said. Don't be thinking about your own response. So quick to listen and then slow to speak so that you can form your response after they're done. Process it, take it all in, and then formulate a response afterwards. That's what these experts are telling people. They're getting paid a lot of money to, to say this. And it's not even their idea. Scripture has, has told us this. It's given us this information long ago. I guess Ecclesiastes really was correct. There, there truly is nothing new under the sun. We're just taking, all these experts are just taking what's been around for millennia and recycling it, reprocessing it, repackaging it for today. And honestly, they're making it their own. They're getting this idea, though, from Scripture. Now, whether they, they read it themselves or they overheard someone else talking about it or maybe God planted it within their heart, ultimately, this information comes from him. He gave us all of this, and he allows us to understand this. So James then addresses the anger of man. He says to be slow to become angry. Now, he's, he's not saying do not become angry. He's saying, 
be slow to become angry. See, anger itself is not a sin. We often think that it is, and, and oftentimes it's because it's our anger that we're thinking about, and I'll, I'll, you'll understand a little bit more about what I'm saying in a moment, but our anger often is sinful, or it leads to sin. But we see examples within Scripture of God getting angry many times over. We see Jesus get angry. And so, yes, we do get angry. It's all part and parcel of that whole being in, made in the image of God. Um, anger at things like, well, think about what God gets angry about. Let's think about that. God gets angry about sin. God gets angry about injustice. He gets angry about evil. Now, those things, it's right to be angry about. There's, there's a justified anger. And so, if we're angry about these same things, it's an indicator of the, of the godliness and the righteousness that we are called to. This is akin to God's anger. Getting angry for that which angers God, speaking out passionately against such things, that's actually good. God desires that we get angry about such things. But man's anger is more often uh, personally motivated. It's, it's selfish in nature. It leads to things like malicious, maliciousness and rage and revenge. And so with that in mind, James urges us to stop and to think about what is driving our anger. Be slow to anger. Is it deserving of God's anger? Or would he view it as petty and divisive. So it's something for us to think about. And then continuing on in verse 21, he says, Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Is it really that prevalent? Was it really that prevalent back then? You know, it couldn't have been that bad, right? But it was. And it continued to be. And it still is that bad. You know, I mentioned Ecclesiastes and, and the, the phrase, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. There really is nothing new under the sun. Uh, we think about technology and we say, well, we've got all this, you know, but we're still doing the same things. Yes, we've got technology that allows us to sin, but we're still committing the same sins, the same evils, wallowing in the same moral filth that they were wallowing in in James' day or back in the Old Testament times, the times of Noah. We're still doing the same things. We're just doing it in different ways, but it's still the same thing. So there is nothing new under the sun. And it's, again, it is that bad. It's, it's the, the world around us uh, teaches us this. Um, Israelites have never been the largest number of people. God's people in general have never outnumbered the, the ungodly. Uh, I, uh, I say never. I imagine there were a few times early on uh, in the early periods of man and shortly after the flood where God's people outnumbered the ungodly. Um, but the majority of our history, w the godly have been outnumbered. And so it's the ungodly who tend to influence everything else, including the godly. And so then we look at what the world teaches us. Well, the world teaches us and yes, there are influences of goodness, of God's grace and his mercy that are taught in the world. But overall, whether it's in school, uh, whether it's in grade school or uh, postgraduate uh, school, postgraduate, pregraduate, um, all the collegiate learning that you, that you can dive into, you're still getting taught. And once you get into the business world, you're still being taught that it's you need to look out for yourself first. There's some altruism. There's some caring for other people. There's a little bit of it thrown in. But the primary response is often look out for yourself. Uh, you need to do for yourself to get ahead and to succeed. And don't be guilty about Don't feel guilty about doing these things. You, you need to get ahead. You deserve to get ahead is what we tell each other. That's what the world teaches us. The world tells us to live life to the fullest, to experience every sensation and every pleasure without any kind of remorse. That's okay to do this. It's a subtle loosening of our morals and our convictions. It's the pushing the boundaries a little more each and every day. And it's the almost imperceivably slow Shake steady, 
imperceivably slow, steady shaking of our faith through fear and through doubt. It's the affirmation of our unrighteous anger, the encouragement that we ought to get even, that we deserve to get even, that we deserve to have our day in court, so to speak. These are some of the hidden in plain sight. They're hidden in plain sight. They're right in front of us. Some of the hidden in plain sight, evil and filth that is prevalent today. It surrounds us. James gets to, gets to the point, as always, but he speaks in love. To finish out verse 21, he says, Humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Welcome God's word into your life and your heart, he says. He placed his word within us. And there's always, and we see, see examples of this throughout history and all around the world, even where no, where they haven't uh, been introduced to the Bible, introduced to the one true God, people seek out and desire to know God. Whether they know who God is or not, there is a desire within us to seek Him out and to know Him. We can choose to deny it, we can look elsewhere, or we can embrace it. The world surrounds us, but nothing of this world can offer us the salvation from God's word. Nothing in this word can in this world can save us. It is only by humbly placing our trust and our faith in God through Jesus that we can be saved. We have this assurance that's delivered to us through God's word and it's affirmed by his spirit which we receive when we accept salvation through Jesus. Now, we were looking at verses uh, 19 through 27, and I realize we're only making it through 21 today. So we're going to continue. We're going to pick up where we left off next week and continue looking at these verses in James. Uh, it's very powerful. My original intent when I when I chose these scriptures was that we'd get through it in one time, but as I started reading through it, it's there's so much content. Like I said, this is a man that grew up with Jesus. He knew him intimately. He knew him very personally. He had his doubts, he had his struggles, but ultimately, he's all in. He is a follower. He came to God through Jesus. He received salvation, and he's speaking the word, and he is speaking powerfully. And so there's just more than we can get through today, but I am looking forward to next week to being able to get in, pick up in verse 22 and continue on from there. So we will close with a word of prayer now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we again thank you for the blessing of this day. We thank you for the blessing of your word and, and the richness of it that uh, allows us to dig so deeply and at the same time uh, makes it impossible to get through all of it today. But Lord, we look forward to the blessing of next week when we're able to get together to continue digging into your word, to continue understanding it and growing closer to you through your son, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you be with each, uh, within the sound of my voice, be with all of our friends, our family, our loved ones, all of your children, and deliver us safely into your kingdom through your son, Jesus. Lord, I pray for eyes to be opened, hearts to be softened, and for many more to come to you through your son, in the very near future, that we may know the establishment of your kingdom here on earth soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.